only person who might show up could be Jean Marie, but we did say we're going to start at yeah, six. Yeah. And Karen's got, uh, she's got her budget presentation to get to in about a half hour, so we're going to. Okay. Okay. Move approval of the minutes. Okay. Yes. Isn't it? <laughs>
not small, but they're, small. They're probably 900 now, I think. Yeah, that's the last I one you think, but yeah. don't, don't, don't quote me. I, I should never, I should never say things from memory. <laughs> but just, just want to put everything in perspective. We may be adding a lot of people compared to other communities, but Scarborough is only 2% of the state, so I just want us to shrink us back down in terms of uh, perspective. So Cumberland County is about 22%, and what you see is the balance of Cumberland County plus Scarborough. Um, so again, just looking at percent, make sure we don't get our head, get too, too big of a head. <laughs> so this is just trying to show you that the rates can be very volatile from decade to decade. And this is just another way of looking at it. Um, and I wanted to do, actually, I don't know if you can see it. I'm afraid the machine is um, enlarging a little past what the screen is. But um, down below are the uh, percentage rates. But these are the actual numbers for the town of Scarborough. Population increases by decade. So you can see, like, 1990 to 2000, that was a really big increase. And I know that you guys around the table probably could feel it um, in terms of the amount of, of growth that was there. And the number of hours we spent in planning. Sure, sure. Days. Absolutely. And so 2010 it moderated a little bit in terms of the actual numbers. In 2016, you know, we're again less than what we've done in other decades, but still pretty good for a uh, main town and pretty good for. Um, having come through a recession, if you will. And so the reason I have this chart up here <coughs> is um, this is representing the actual uh, uh, increases, growth in the state of Maine. So the data that you were looking at just before this was 2016. Only the state of Maine's data is out for 2017. And I want you to look in 2017, the growth from 2016 to 2017 in terms of population growth is like double. It's a huge increase, and you have to anticipate when we get our 2017 numbers, there's nothing that tells me that we wouldn't uh, be seeing a fairly substantial increase from 2016 to 2017. Um, just, just give you some demographics in terms of characteristics. Uh, I like this because I you know, you sort of talk about the, the uh, kids and the seniors. And so here, under 18, right now in 2016, we're about 22% of the total Scarborough population. 65 and older is about 19%. Um, median age is 45. You can see that's a fairly significant increase in the median age for the town. Uh, I think Tom likes to say that we're, we're the oldest uh, community, but we're not. There's a, a lot of communities within Cumberland County that are struggling with um, this particular uh, age group. And then just to track it, because we want to you know, understand what's going on with the seniors. So um, in 2000, we we're 65 and older, about 2,000, I'm sorry, about 13% of the population. 2010, we we're 19%. So we've added, what? You have two 2010s up there. Oh, darn it. So is that 2016? Um, yes, thank you very much. So 2016, yes. we're at 19.3. So it's a draft. <laughs> <laughs> Good. How about you remember that? You to to us first. Exactly, exactly. Is that graph in here? Oh, that no, graph is not so. in here. I pulled no, that. I didn't see it. Yeah. I think this is the what we The numbers are in there, but the numbers yeah, are out. Exactly. And then down at the bottom, you can sort of see, I wanted to look at, we used to call 85 plus the frail elderly, but I just don't think that term is appropriate anymore. Um, I think people are healthier longer, um, but the percentage of population 85 plus, 1.3% in 2000, 2.5% in uh, 2015. All right, again, I'm sorry I'm rushing, but um, I want to give you guys time to ask some questions. So one thing that I think is really important for us to understand as we're looking at the, you know, the future is talking about, all right, well, what types of households are actually in um, the community? And we just equate with the household 
is the same thing as an occupied unit as far as the census is concerned. So that's all it's talking about. And the household refers to all the folks in that particular household. So what we have is, oh, maybe it surprises uh, people, 25% of our households in 2016 are one-person households. Yeah. 6% um, are, they call them non-family households, but it's just unrelated people living in the same household. You've got another, uh, essentially a third of family households with children under 18. And then the balance of the households are family households. So there are kids, and there may be kids living at home that are older than 18, mm -hmm. or older than 17. How many data on whether that one person household, 25% is male or female? I think we do have some of that. And I can't remember whether it's in one of the data charts, but I do know I, I can pull that info. Yeah, there was some info on that. Good. Yeah. How, do you, how do you handle places like Atria and Piper Shores and data? Um, it depends on, on how, how, what types of units there are. Atria is going to be um, considered a, a group quarters because they're, half of them at least are not individual um, yeah. units. But some of them that are the apartments, mm -hmm. the Census Bureau um, would treat that as an apartment, as a rental unit. Okay. But it does depend on to the reporting person, because remember, all this is self-reported. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I think there's a little bit of blending that goes in there, but technically, if it's an independent unit with its own kitchen and bathroom, and you know, it should be counted as part of this. Okay. Now, income. I just wanted to um, uh, show us. It's always good to understand where we stand. Uh, so you've got Cumberland County at $61,000, $62,000 for their uh, median household income. You've got Scarborough, certainly above that. Um, we are fifth. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Yes, fifth. <laughs> I had to count the little discs. We are fifth in terms of overall um, income within Cumberland County. So Cumberland, Cape Elizabeth, Falmouth, uh, North Yarmouth. Um, interesting enough, those all have um, higher median household incomes. Interestingly enough, when I pulled the data, I think I pulled, because sometimes there can be a difference between household income and family income and per capita income, um, and we ranked fifth in all of those, no matter where you went. The top communities changed a little bit, like Falmouth and Cape Elizabeth and sometimes Yarmouth got in there. Those all you know, um, changed around a little bit, but we are a solid five, <laughs> uh, no matter what we do. Uh, but the one interesting thing about the income from the 2016 data is that for the first time, we really saw the household uh, income start to rise a little bit. In the, according to the American Community Survey, if you looked from 2010 to 2016, there were up a little, down a little, up a little, up, down a little. So for 2016, it's the first time that you see, you know, at least a noticeable increase in the income. And it happened really, you know, in, in most of the coastal towns as well. Um, and similarly, when I pulled wage data, for the first time, the wage data showed an uptick. So that's good. And this because I just really wanted to use an iPhone uh, image. I had it. I had to use it. So we're talking about mobility. And yes, has the mobile iPhone has nothing to do with these data, this data. But it's cheap. Yeah, you know. Um, so the geographic mobility, with, which the census is calling, the length of time at, a current, at your current residence. And I think for Scarborough, we have a really interesting profile. So 5%, this is 2016, 5% of our households have been in that household for a year or less. 29% have been six years or less. So 29% of households are new to 2000, from 2010. And that's residents, not town resident, right? So if you lived in... That's Scarborough. Yeah. 
answer so is it, are you talking about how long, you've been, how long someone's been in Scarborough or how long they've been in their house? The, the only definition is in their house. Okay. So there's, there are probably a few folks who, there's a, a, a sliver of that that probably is people moving from home to home. All right, so 20% minus one household. <laughs> there, will be, there, there will be others. I've um, seen that as my neighborhood has changed, and uh, there are a lot that are, they stay five, six, or seven years, and then they, they move because it's a different kind of housing. It's smaller. It's not starter homes. It's a start it's a start homes. homes. And right now, we've got several starter homes that have been either renovated or sold. Mm -hmm. and Three on Maple Avenue and four on the Sunset. And there's 16% in between six and forever. So yeah, right. That's that's a small number, it seems to me. Yeah, the 29%. No, oh, the, the five. gaps between six and eight and eight. And eight. Yeah. 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 So yeah, here you're you're saying 50. Seven percent are Maine natives. Yes. In the report, you talk about they were Scarborough, right? I, so, I should double check that, but I think that's but I think that's, that's main na oh, I'm sorry. It's main natives living in Scarborough. So of all Scarborough residents, fifty percent of them are native. To Scarborough or to Maine? To Maine, I believe. They, but they were but born I should go back and double check that. They were born in Maine. Yes. Yeah. They were born in Maine. Okay. Just want to make sure. I know that everybody has a very strict <laughs> definition. <laughs> First breath. Yes. Born in Technically born in Maine, they didn't ask about parentage. Well, that's <laughs> just, okay. I'm just just the, the child itself. It's, it's not like anything over six years is considered to be a Maine native. Yeah. So those the first two and the last one are really separate. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, you know. <laughs> and if you go to Ancestry.com, there's a lot of the French Canadians that came down to the Maine. Uh, the parents brought them down. Mom had her baby in Lewiston or Brunswick. And they were baptized. Let's just remind ourselves, you know, we we are primarily a single family uh, home community at this point. So 78.5% of all of our occupied units, households, are owner occupied. 21.5% are renters. Interesting, 32% of the rented homes are single family. And between 2010 and 2016, um, the percent of renters with children under 18 dropped from 32% to 21%. And see, this may be where you're seeing some of the influx of the seniors and getting counted toward the rentals. Right. So I think that's probably what's happening. It's going to change that. And 46, this is not a surprise, 46% of the renters are single person households. Um, this is, I was hoping Jean Marie was going to be here, but, um, you know, this was pulled from the, uh, from the sold housing units. Um, so in 2017, or since 2010, the number of units sold were up 78%. And this I found really hard. Um, to believe too that the, but the median price of the sold homes was at, at 80% in 17, in 17 years, which is, I mean, uh, sorry, seven years. Um, and so I, this did not come from the ACS, this came from um, an aggregated source of, uh, of uh, local listing service info. So I think this is one of those stats that we want to you know, really double check. And we can look at ACS data also does some of the um, uh, median price uh, homes. We can certainly take a look at that. I think if you look at age, if you look at the data on age, because again, Green Acres area, there have been um, like eight or nine homes that have sold the yep. starter homes. So it's changing that data in my view. Right. Okay. Right. Because the numbers are going to be So median price of sold homes was up 80%. Yep. And so that, that I'm, I'm struggling with, so I want to double check yeah, it with another source. I sold in 2017. I know. Okay. Yeah. It's a little confusing. But I, I get what you're going for. Yeah. yeah. Just 
you know, this is like the, the gut check of what's really happening in the community. Mm -hmm. This is not the median price of all homes. Just those homes. It's only, only those that sold in 2017. But if, but if you think of some of the developments that have gone in, there's been some high-end stuff yep. that's gone in oh, in yeah. that time frame. So Almost that, every time. that may not be that far off. Yeah. I don't think it is that far off. I just want to make sure that we're talking about within the, within the year 2017. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Correct. That was for the whole the whole year, and I believe the first quarter. Is the first quarter, first two months, and again, going from memory, so uh, was a little bit more. Exactly, it is. Uh, it is a little bit higher than that. Um, I think it was like 402 or something like that. So we, you know, we we certainly have high end housing. What does this to do with affordable housing? Yeah. yeah. It's not. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk a little bit about jobs. And the first thing I want you to know is there are, there are several different sources of job data. And they can all look very different. Um, so I'm going to dissect this for you. Um, this, two stats up here, three if you consider the total. The first thing, the wage and salary jobs, that's reported by the um, Department of Labor. Those jobs represent um, employment in companies that are covered by unemployment insurance. Which in means, yes, correct, in Scarborough. Um, but the entire data set, you know, mm -hmm. for the state of Maine, it's sometimes called wage and salary, sometimes it's called covered employment, and that relates to whether or not uh, there's unemployment insurance pay. So what that means is if you're self-employed or like a lot of the hair salons, those are like independent stations. So the hair salon, uh, the person who rents the booth, yeah, may not be uh, an employee of the firm. They're renting a booth. So those types of jobs are not included in wage and salary. And so we make a little bit of a, an estimate. So I'm going to say the self-employed contract, that's, that's my estimate. And I do it based on a percentage of you know, some national data, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some other employment data that gives me a sense of, you know, I don't think we're too far off. Um, and this is something that just, to give you a flavor, so in terms of the number of jobs to residents, we're almost at a one-to-one -one basis in terms of employees, jobs in Scarborough versus people. Um, and then between 2000... 10 in 2016, we've added 140 net new wage and salary establishments. And establishments just means it's a, it's a, it's located, yeah, it's, and it's located in, in Scarborough, but like Hanford is a firm that has estab establishments all over. So sometimes they distinguish between firms and establishments, but these are unique to Scarborough, 140 um, hesitate to use the word company because a company could have more than two locations, uh, but the, their physical addresses, so to speak. It would be interesting to see the ratio against people who are 16 plus or sure. more work age. You know? Yeah. And I'll let you know, like, Portland um, has, being the central hub that it is, has always had more employees than people living in town. And so that presents some interesting dynamics, uh, too. But I think you know one of the, the interesting challenges as we look at uh, the economic development pieces is trying to understand, well, how many folks are living and working in the same community? Because that's a great opportunity for folks, and you know cuts down on commute, and you know so we, we do have some of that. I think is in your uh, packet. If you, if you could stand to read through it, you could find it. Um, uh, and so, just want to talk about our largest employment sectors. Healthcare is growing and increasing in its um, number of, numbers of employees. Um, it's about 21% of Scarborough's total uh, employment now. Retail is 16.5%, decreasing. Whereas healthcare is increasing in dollars. Decreasing by percentage. By percentage. I think the 
numbers were still, yeah. if I remember, they're increasing, very close. They're yeah. increasing slightly, right. but their percentage of... Exactly. And the, the, the interesting you know, piece for retail for us to, to think about, too, is um, if you compare employment to square footage of retail, you're going to see a pretty big jump in square footage of retail, but no real increase in employment. And that's because the retail is more efficient, more, um, you know, fewer employees serving uh, a, a larger amount of square footage, fewer employees per square feet. Um, and the <laughs> other piece to these two industries, too, is remember retail, well, very wonderful jobs. They do tend to be low pay, lower paying than other sectors. Healthcare tends to be a little bit higher um, paying. So you do have a, a you know, a reasonably chunk of the economy that is on the lower side of the wage scale. And in terms of sort of um, uh, any service industry, like restaurant or mm -hmm. lodging, are any of those included in retail numbers? They're, they're, or those they're hopefully isolated. There's yeah. a restaurant, um, you know, there's a, a separate category for those. Mm -hmm. And if you asked about um, uh, restaurant and lodging, yeah. is how it's usually uh, categorized. That's about seven to eight percent of our employment. Again, that's going to spike during the summer. So it depends if you're looking at third quarter numbers or if you're looking at um, annual. These are average annual numbers. And then I did want to talk a little bit about entre entrepreneurship because this is, I think, setting up some of where um, I think the SEDCO board is interested in. Uh, going um, and talking about uh, how do we begin to capture some of the uh, entrepreneurial activity that's going on here. So this is these are some numbers that I you know, I pulled from a, a new source. There's a um, uh, a some some uh, research institutes that are really looking at entrepreneurship. And one of the things they're saying is, okay, so 8.3 percent of your population they're business owners. So theoretically. 8% of our adult population has its own business. They're not all in Scarborough. So for us, is there an opportunity to sort of isolate who the business owners are who live in Scarborough but are not nece don't necessarily have their business here? It's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's a potential, and this one I find this is this is challenging my perceptions. That there's uh, from this one uh, source of it, though, they're saying there's a potential of in Scarborough alone, 33 new firms a month. All by Scarborough people. Yeah, I don't think it Yeah. So part of it is like, uh, these numbers were done by um, main entrepreneurship numbers. Um, again, I, 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 I presenting it, and I'm like, it's challenging my my sense. But you know what? Even if it's a tenth of that, that's a lot of entrepreneurship activity that we as SETCO should be looking at and saying, how can I um, help and nurture this new business formation? And what are the types of things that we can really do to focus on a startup? And one of the other stats that really, I think, got me was if a firm, a new firm survives five years, they have a 68% average growth rate over that five year period. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're probably micro firms and they're going from one to three people or something like that, but that's still very important. Um, and it's homegrown and um, we, we need to figure out how we can um, find them, nurture them, and um, you know, help them grow. Uh, and like I said, 28.6% of businesses are women-owned, according to, this is from the economic census, so that's a 2012 number. And this is where this 2,264, that's from the economic census. Um, that's an extrapolation of the 2012 number to 2016. This is the number of businesses that they say are out there. They don't have employees. So some of those are these new businesses that are forming. Some of them are, everybody knows somebody who created a business and they're, you know, 
uh, as, a, as a side gig, um, and it, they run them. And then some businesses Cutting. create multiple Cutting. firms. <laughs> Honey. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but again, I think what we're what we're seeing here is um, there's a rich uh, entrepreneurial behavior that's going on in Maine and in Scarborough theoretically, and we need to figure out how to, to capture and work with those folks. Um, and you know, I think that's just a um, a, a, a rich opportunity for us. Um, so that's really the entrepreneurship piece. And then, I, guess, yeah. I still, I, I, I brought this in. This is something we talked about from, um, you know, really when we were looking at the uh, uh, Scarborough Downs and the Crossroads folks. Uh, it's their, that terminology that they're using, which is, we're not really quite suburban. We're not quite urban. We're bringing up this. You're, we're growing both our, our uh, population and our um, employment, and you know I think that's some of the trends that we're seeing is how do we um, keep all the great things about the residential part of our community, um, but grow our um, economy in ways that are compatible with the town and compatible with the employment and skills here, and um, I think there's some. Uh, interesting opportunities to do that. And I'm going to stop because now it's 6.30. Uh, and I do not want to make the Finance Committee mad as I'm going through my budget. Um, but there's more, there's a lot more info in here. Um, one of the things that I would point out that uh, I thought was interesting is we talk about traffic a lot, but when they looked at commute times, it was almost the same. Matter of fact, it decreased by just a little tiny bit. Um, I thought some of the some of the commute information was, was kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. The, the commuting data. Yeah, the commuting yeah. data, both the, the volume and some of the, the directions. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I know we don't have a lot of time. But yeah. One question. Yeah. Having read down through all the data, the thing that it left me with was, so what are we supposed to do with this as part of this process? Yeah. What, what's the next step for this piece that we need to be focusing on or coming up with some recommendations? Well, I'm going to speak to the economy piece. Um, so there's, a, there's several things in here that are relevant to looking at um, how we go about uh, growing our economy over the next 10 years. One is um, making sure we're taking advantage of the health care and the opportunities there. Um, making sure that we are targeting um, in a market that makes sense. Um, we get some of this data, we get some of that from here. Um, it's reaching out on this entrepreneurship piece and part of that is land use related. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that we come back to um, really looking at how we treat home occupations. And I think uh, Brian uh, Longstaff and I have been talking about can we make it simpler? Are there ways to um, ease the home occupation uh, criteria? That may not be the right word, but ease the uh, what seems like some of the red tape to get more of home occupations to register, number one, so that we know about them and we can help them. Um, but looking at, are we creating any excess burdens there? I don't know that we are, but um, I'm going to tell you that sometimes we have questions where it's like, Oh, you don't really fit neatly um, into the home occupation piece. You're really a separate business than your home. And so there's a, there's a lot of things that we need to, to look at as a companion. For affordable housing, I think what we're, just, what we're just saying is the pricing continues to grow, continues to increase. And that's really for us to analyze um, what does this mean for our policy with affordable housing? How can we um, create more opportunity in the market? Or do we need to do other types of intervention? How do we do that without just, killing off exactly. the people that are 85 or 65? I, I guess what I sort of said is part of the comp plan is taking a snapshot of who are we. You know, yeah. it's, it's sort of, and this is a lot of what's here. Yeah. Is, and, are the trends that we've been seeing continuing? Okay, they are. You can't, we don't know what the future is necessarily going to 
whole, but it certainly helped inform that. So I think that's, that's a lot of what this is about. Um, I think in terms of sort of our land use recommendations and the, the other works, how this gets folded in, in you know, like our, certainly it's going to help inform the other components, but this is a lot of okay. this sort of that informational basic, here's who we are as yeah. a community. So, so knowing what the price is of houses that are being built right now is something that you really need to know, especially if you think we're concerned about low income, I mean, right. affordable housing. Geez, it's only as bad as we think it is. Yeah. Well, yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> There's also that it was, it was referenced at one of the meetings fairly recently. The question of, you know, is the rapid growth something that should be a point of pride and something that we should, that, is, that the town should continue, should try to. Encourage, or is it something that we need to? Is a potential red flag that we? Think and that's the kind of discussion that we will do, you know, yeah. in terms yeah. of actually right. forming the plan. Absolutely. Yeah. This is right. just information. It's also so interesting to think back about what we thought in the previous plan, yeah, isn't that yeah. because both those points where we wanted to control growth, yeah. and we also wanted to increase affordable housing. So it's interesting. Did we it succeed in either of those? Yeah. That's a good question. Right. 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 Yeah. So I think there's a you know there's a lot of uh, um, you know different aspects, and I guess part of what you're going to do is think back as you're looking at the policy. Does that match what we know the community took uh, And are we missing are we missing a piece? And I think one of the things that that probably um, you know certainly we fill it in the planning department is. You know, we've used up a lot of the easily easily developable land. So what's the next step? A lot of the land that needs to be developed is going to have some environmental constraints. And that's a good thing because that's where it should be. But it you know, you, you may not see the types of growth rates we've had before. Um, in a in a different mode or a different style of development. Right. Okay. We have to build I noticed you have a few sources in here, but do. you could share any Absolutely. other links that you use. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Good luck. Thank you, guys. Good luck. Thank yeah, you. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Can you watch it all? <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I tried my best. Thank you. 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 Thank you
chapter to play right. important, but we have seen other chapters. Right. So I mean, there could be some references being made. But I think your your point is right on. Because I did have actually just in the next sentence, they sort of talk about understanding yes. uh, the character of Scarborough's village, hamlets, and neighborhoods. Well, we've defined hamlets, but we haven't yet defined neighborhoods. So I said, well, what? That was my sort of comment. Was yeah. we got to be sure we're. What do we mean by the neighborhoods? Are we now talking about? Have to find I think that's a set of cameras. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah, I think <coughs> when you think back historically, and I, I have to refer to the area that I live in, the Green Acres area, mm -hmm. here, I, it's not titled anywhere. Right. But it was the first major development planned in 1923. I have the map up here. The, the proposal. Right. And to me, that that sort of the neighborhood, that's it's the not defined Hamlet as we've yeah, sort of thought. There's not space for you know, right. well, coordinated activities. It's going to be a little bit more because of the latent thing. So, you know, we, we used up. But it, it, it certainly is a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of this form under character and context, going with and putting in the form of character based coding. There's something for us to study. Yeah, that was a question I had, because um, that seems to be their, their, to me, as I read through this, that was the silver bullet. That was the answer to all ills. Well, I don't and, know all I, ills. It, that was the way I read it, was, okay, that's one tool in the mm -hmm. toolbox. What, where are the others? Yeah. Um, so that was one of the comments I had written the down. The last sentence is pretty... Yeah. The most effective means. Exactly. In some places, yeah. In some cases, it may be for for a variety of sites, but not, right. not, not in general. general. Not and, in general. And it seemed, you know, it, it, we sort of talked about, at least internally anyway, some of our zoning, at least one on one, like the TVCs, were sort of this hybrid form based zoning as it is. We, we already bring buildings closer and put parking behind, but that's. I don't know that those are the biggest nuts we have to crack. It's, I mean, that's certainly part of it, but we already have design standards, and maybe we need to refine those. The other, but um, again, it just seemed like that's a piece to the issues. But I think you know some of the bigger contextual issues that I feel like we have with our built environment is the fact that these activity centers, as we just sort of talked about them, the Downs, Dunstan, and Oak Hill, are our historic, or at least Oak Hill and Dunstan are sort of our <coughs> villages, and Dunstan uh, Downs has been identified for a growth area. Well, they all sit on impaired or threatened watersheds. Right. So, you know, we have this balance of, we want to direct growth to these areas because that's where we have infrastructure that can, you know, potentially support density. But we do have these environmental conflicts but if we run away from those areas, we could just be creating other impaired <laughs> watersheds. So I was, I'm sort of hoping that these guys can help us crack that nut a little bit more than just design. But I think we, we were talking character-based as we were comparing Higgins and Pine Point. Mm -hmm. They have the same nature as far as you know the, the people that they serve, but how we're going to approach. It does. It does say in this character and context mm. part that just before the um, up, up a couple of lines, it says third step is creating block standards. Yes, design and architectural guidelines. Yes. Mm -hmm. And an example of this approach is the form-based code. It's an example of that approach. Mm -hmm. There are other examples, and I think the best where the start. But the next sentence though. seems to go. Seems to really double down. Take and, it. Say, yeah, and they said that's the yeah. and they reference that's there's an there's another area back here where they reference form based character yeah. based zoning as the answer. It's like well okay yep yeah, again yeah. there is are there more and and not to say again no, perfectly I, good I, tool. I think we're all but, on, on yeah. one thing that one thing that kind of jumped out to yeah. me on this and, and it's understandable that one loved in a, in a sense given that this is talking about the built environment and most of the built environment is in these villages, as we refer to them. But by 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 area, the majority of the town is more kind of suburban and rural. Yep. And I know, again, this might also be a function of the fact that we're kind of looking at this section in isolation. But I guess I'd like to see some, whether it's here or elsewhere, make sure that, that there's some recognition and consideration of the rest of the town and, and thinking about 
these things there as well. Because um, I think sometimes there's a tendency to, again, understandably to an extent, focus on the coastal areas and the Route 1 corridor and these village nodes. And then, yeah, then there's North Scarborough and West Scarborough and kind of the rest of the town. And that's a lot of the town. Maybe not population-wise, although there are a lot of people who live out. It could be where the both Yeah, occurs. so I, I think that's a big, especially if we're thinking about <coughs> planning, um, looking at this in the longer term, I just want to make sure that we're but that's not getting short shrift. Right. Right. And actually, I think one of the notes I sort of drafted was, you know, most the residents in town sort of identify with the town with where you where you live. Most of you don't live in Dunstan or Oak Hill. You know, it's in the Green Acres type neighborhood or mm -hmm. you know, Hill. Or it's, uh, I live out broad term. Right. That's that's right. Yeah. what right. you hear from so you, yeah. you experience the centers. But, what we've promoted in the last 10 years is growth versus non-growth. All that mm -hmm. depth that you say that they're all three on pair waterways. Mm -hmm. that, I think that's, that I remember us really weighing the environmental consequences right. of the pushing growth down the Route 1 corridor. Mm -hmm. We didn't think about it. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> that's definitely very important. Right. Yeah. I mean, at, at, you know, frankly, I think that's my hope with this comp plan is that, again, we've sort of talked about we need to start to weave all these factors together. It's if we're going to direct growth to these areas, and there might be you know, a host of good reasons to do that, we need to at least recognize the challenges and how do we, what are, what are the methodologies, what are the tools to, to deal with those? Yeah, I thought the access to the resources automatically, which we're talking about now, because it talks about yep. making connections with nature, incorporating yeah. topography, water, tells you the design of the built environment, but it doesn't it doesn't address what you just what you just discussed has to be more um, right in your face if you look in the, in the front and what it says here at the very end of that paragraph is that the town should work to preserve these important connections to nature while finding new ways to connect people with that sector, etc. Et but nowhere in there does it say anything about the natural resources having an impact, having the, that growth in our growth areas has an impact on natural resources, and that is not in Yep, and I also think it's important to highlight the importance of, um, to highlight the value of the, of, of the watersheds and, and yep. the natural environment in its own right, not purely as a resource for people to enjoy, although not to recreate. that's a big part of it, and it's understandable, and it makes sense to to kind of make sure that there's a constituency for it. But I hate to see it considered only to the extent that people can go kayaking or or have a view. I mean, the view thing in Scarborough, as we know, can become a hot button issue. Um, and I just, yeah, I think it's important to think about the, you know, the streams themselves and the, the environment itself. Before we move on from natural resources, I would like to put in a plug for scenic views. I mean, from the previous comp plan, we've done a lot of time. We've got on a bus. Has anybody here at Judy Bean with you with us? We've got on the bus and we've looked at the view corridors. Yeah. It was a big deal for us. And as far as we can see, it didn't make it into the comp plan. So I would like to make a big deal about the fact that we do need to identify what those, what those uh, scenic views were. And I think that we would have a how awesome are we right now? <laughs> if we have a listing of what the new corridors are, it's not I'm not pushing. Sure. Well, I guess, so that's that's a, uh, a question. Would this comp plan actually identify those view corridors? Because then I think that's a diff we need to then start an earnest effort of doing, are you thinking of pulling out what you what was done back 10, 12 you years ago? That. Or are, would this comp plan reference the fact that we should identify our scenic? I, I don't think this plan is going to be where we identify the scenic corridors. I think if we can reference that the, the town should take on the effort and undergo a study to identify the scenic corridors. I would go with the first option. They can make a recommendation that we go through the previous yeah. material to see what they were. Yeah. In other words, let's not be inventory. Yeah. There are going to be some that are going to be useless because we didn't do anything about it and they're all developed and they're gone. Well, and, yeah, I guess to me that does lead to that question.
question. You know, what, once you identify them, what can you do about it? Because right. they're at a, at a legal level, you, you can debate whether people are entitled to have views. And I think we all would agree that these view corridors exist and they're valuable. But from a pragmatic planning perspective, once they've been identified, are we going to, is the town going to, are there going to be moratoriums? Are there going to be height limits? I think that, that's the kind of thing we have um, to take a look at. And, right. and the fact that it's so, actually in the comp plan that these are the scenic areas that we have identified is a big deal. Well, and so I guess that's my question is, if we want to take the time to identify the scenic corridors, then I think that's a multi-month sort of no, public not, outreach not. process, or, or is it just the six or eight of us around the... Comp plan should yeah. include direction to create a right. list. That's what he said. That, that's what I would say. I, oh, that's what I wanted to... The list yeah. could be taken from the archives and then checked. You don't have to be in the entire... Right, as part of the process. Right. I, I, usually, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of them were probably affected yeah, I think by we're what was going on at the time yeah. that they were identified. <laughs> One in particular that was Hobby's Parkway, I wholeheartedly disagreed that it was a, it was a, a visual vista, of, you know, that I, I said, oh, let's go to Hobby's Parkway today. <laughs> but, no, but, but there was a lot going on about, about Hobby's Parkway at that time, so. I think it's, yeah. Okay. So so I would, yeah. Take a look at what they, what we did. Oh, and this whole thing on the store would be supposed to start away. It's something that's got to be written into the plan that really empowers the Historic Preservation Implementation Committee. These are these, these are a lot of fond of knowledge, but they don't feel empowered. Believe me, I know I've been hanging out there for the past couple of months. I'm working on a particular project that makes them a resource for me. And I'm blown away yeah. by what the Historic Society has. Yeah. But those people are the ones that really feed into the sort of preservation implementation committee, or certainly could. I, mean, it, I don't think it works that way. So somehow or another, there's some empowerment mm -hmm. that needs to happen here. And I don't know how you how you do that in terms of bringing it into the plan. So There's all kinds of things that are not on um, the uh, National Racial Register of Places. Yep. No, we have our local list of 48, I think it is. In our ordinance, and yeah. So, um, so you're talking about a reference to tying the historic society in with the because here it references the historic the uh, preservation implementation yeah. committee, which is a town committee, but the historic society is a their separate so body, needs to be part of the town. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
maybe it was neighborhood meetings, maybe it was Plant Blues, I can't remember when, but a lot, oftentimes people talking about having connections between the neighborhoods. Again, you know, not necessarily our hamlets or our villages, you know, but just, uh, I'm on page four under community, neighborhood, and design, walkability. You know, I think a lot of this is focused around walkability in sort of those activity centers, but connecting, you know, one sort of rural, suburban subdivision with another one. We have sort of these open spaces that have been created, but now it's about making those connections so you can maybe go. I'd say the most important, um, not, that's not what I should say, the very important part of this Walkability mm -hmm. is the last few lines under destination where it says most of the town residents don't live within five yep. distance. So care should be taken when developing or redeveloping neighborhoods to provide walking amenities so as many residents as possible. In other words, that's a that's yep. it's a big thing to make sure it's playing up, not just lost in the word that. And the biking at the end of the next section. Mm -hmm. no. Biking the same thing. Yeah. yeah. But wouldn't we need to at that point, isn't that an ordinance change that's going to be required because I'm you know, oh, yeah. sitting on the planning board, people sitting on the planning board. How are they going to be able to enforce that this new development needs to be able to connect to the other development? And part of the problem you run into there is that the other development didn't make, didn't make the, the provisions for the connectivity. So now what the hell do you do? Right. You can't go back and ask the residents of the other development to now put in. We tried that. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. so you can't. I'll give you another example. It's, it's Green Acres again. But there was a, a bridge put in uh, just as you come into Green Acres Road, and it was supposed to connect to a pathway that went to the rear of that parcel and down to, along the river and connected up with another one. That has never happened. If we have a bridge to nowhere. Yeah. Nobody has ever maintained it or established it, you know, so that it works. Yeah. That's where, yeah, you do get in some of the tension between what people, what people, it's being used very broadly, what people often say they want in a community and then what they vote for when they yeah. put their put their wallets in their checkbook when they go to buy a house and they go and buy a house at the end of the cul-de-sac and they don't want people cutting through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, these are, I'm sure there are going to be some more interesting conversations about this. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and with the crossroads right now, we're talking about connectivity there and the Sawyer Road question. Right. And, you know, that's another example. I just thought, the, when we get to this property, not tonight, when we get to this property, we have a lot of plenty of time for it because it really does have to be made a big, big deal. But so far in our history, it hasn't been. In terms of connectivity between connectivity. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, we for too, and as, as you know, Susan, and you too, on the planning board, when we're when we're talking about side even sidewalks, yeah, not even connectivity, but just having sidewalks in the neighborhood, right. and the attitude generally <coughs> seems to be the default attitude is, oh, it's not like where are they going to walk to? to right. <coughs> and it's more expensive. So why should we have to do it? But so there are areas where there are four of them. I mean, there are successes in that. I mean, you might think of any, but I know if, you know, you see the end of the sidewalk, but somewhere down the line, you're going to be like that. I mean, I live in a good example up at Jim Cornell and Cumberland, which was developed in two or three phases. And there was a fire, a fire uh, path that is now a connection to probably three or four gradually larger loops between Maple and Honeywell Hill yeah. and the new neighborhood, which works fabulously for people walking. Yeah, um, lots of people if walk. that, you know, if that was, if it was simply as simple as the easement, mm -hmm. um, let a leftover fire easement to, you know. Mm -hmm. I think it's definitely possible, and, and the time has come to exchange your mom and really take on it and okay. chew on this. And there is value, yeah, yeah, there is, yeah, there is from, based on the planning board experience, there is value in having these principles yeah. in the comp plan, yeah. just at that level, because yeah. applicants, yeah. The developers and other applicants will read it, and they will say, you know, this is this is consistent with the comp plan, or you know, it gives us it gives us something to it gives us something to kind of hang our hats on. But you can talk about it, but just again, going back to you need to have a teeth, right? So yep. the only way you have teeth is you got to put it in the right side. Right. So you got to put teeth.
otherwise right. it's basically yeah. negotiated. Yeah, exactly. With, but if it's not in the comp plan, then we can't get it into an order. Right. So yeah. know, this is okay. sort of our yeah. first. I guess what I'm saying is to keep the plan definition of what we want to do, mm -hmm. not just, you know, just a bunch of windows. Indeed, it's important that it is expected that that kind of language. Is there a reason why they didn't include bikeability, Jay? Um, no sort of Walkability is sort of more important here, remember? Yeah, I don't, I don't know why. Um, yeah, I would think maybe we could even consider this walkability more of a um, uh, alternative mode. You know, yeah. Right, multimodal or really. alternative mode. They talk about the whole quarter mile thing, which right. they say people aren't going to walk more than a quarter of a mile. The bikeability takes it's a little bit bigger. Right? Yeah. In the in the transportation chapter, they talked a bit about bikeability, uh, the ability for bikes. Um, sure. So, uh, I guess that's a question if we want to have that as one of the principles for. Okay, so are we on the next year sign? Yeah. 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 Wherever you want to go. Well, I don't know. <laughs> are we done with the next year? Sure. <laughs> Yeah, and I think sort of the connectivity bit does start, that also touches on what we were. This seems to be um, section three. It seems to be sort of taking what we're already doing yeah. and mm -hmm. patting on the back and saying more. Well, the mixed use yeah. piece? Mm -hmm. Part, principle five, is it okay if I go to the chapter? Sure. 
Um, I love the large scale. When we did the first comp plan, we worked with Terry Dewan a lot. And Terry, that was one of his favorite words, scale. We start to think about that housing and <coughs> the sense of the community. It's all about scale, which is one of the reasons why some of the buildings that we put into Oakville haven't worked, just because the scale wasn't right. So um, I just think that, again, this is restating what we already know. There's nothing new here. But, but I like the last part. The most important aspect of creating buildings that are scaled appropriately is the design of the first floor and how it relates to sidewalk and pedestrian areas adjacent to it. That's not the only part of scale that's important. First step. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The next step up would be vehicular or longer range. Yeah. I'm sorry, say that again? I was just thinking the next yeah. step up in the scale would be from more from a distance from the vehicular or from a, yeah, the next level up yeah. in scale portion from the pedestrian to be. I think what I'm asking for is that the word scale be really big in this whole definition of design because it really does require a site-by-site um, -site decision. How does this look? from the bicycles, from the pedestrian, from the car. How does it look from the people that live behind, uh, that work away behind it? Um, it's not like taking sidewalks. It's not just to see what the natural layout of the present property is, although we want to continue to do that, but also, what's the scale of what's going to work in here? That's what we did down at Higgins. We went down and we looked at it. Yes, and, but we, and we're not doing as much when it comes to developments for a new building. I mean, we don't use that word, and I think it's a very important one to Well, I think a lot of our ordinances do talk about human scale, but don't we don't really true. know what human yeah. scale... Well, well, what does it mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, what, what does that mean? You know, land board members are, you know... We, we always come back to Route 1 for good yeah. reason, and that, that's one of the, the biggest challenges in that area, I mean, you put something in there, so because you generally most people experience it from a from a vehicle, and most people just want to get through, and so there's that's another tension is between that mm -hmm. that very utilitarian uh, purpose of, of the road versus I things like walkability on scale. And, I think what I'm asking for here is somehow or another to present this in such a way that we don't ignore it. Planning board does pay attention occasionally, but not much. It's not a, it's not a big ticket. Well, it's subjective. Right. It's hard to modify. Right. That doesn't yeah. mean we shouldn't do it. How do you say well, that? Yeah. yeah. You can get some objective data. Hopefully, these people can do it. Hopefully, planning board's doing some of it. Well, yeah. 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 Not a big
others felt the same, but that would certainly so make that comments. Would have had a question on the town's role in the built environment, the green, the green introduction part. The last couple of sentences say many municipalities create partnerships with the development community, blah, blah, blah. Um, I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> so if, it, if it's going to be something that we're going to consider, it's going to be a little more in detail than we can have. But it does reference type and scale. And a seal as well as in the second sentence. You may have to have a whole yeah, it was, yeah, uh, reading on scale. Mm -hmm. Is it literally talking about creating partnerships, or is it more along the lines of what's going on right now with, with the Rispera and Downs, right. where right. it's a collaborative, collaborative. multi-plan yeah. 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 master planning process? Right. But the, the, the basic tenets of the zoning are in place. Right. Now it's... Yeah, 
There's right, and there you know there's kind of a whole sort of subsidy side of that, and then there's the what some people might refer to as kind of naturally occurring affordable housing, which can be incentivized through different uh, dimensional and density regulations at times. And, and I'm trying to remember what, as an example, it was a few months ago, someone came in front of the planning board that the, you know, that it was, in some ways it was an affordable housing. It really was basically just kind of apartments, but, you know, no frill. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was down Dunstan Village, yeah, uh, yeah, Harold right, Burnham. Right, mm -hmm. yes. right. And, I, and the way he articulated it at the time was, we really, and, and I'm taking that as word, you know, he really wanted, saw this as an unmet need in the town. Obviously, he has an interest in probably wants to make some money on it, too, understandably. But he saw it as an unmet need in the community, and this was a way of providing that without any outside subsidy or any, anything sort of... Somebody said he picked his brain about all that subsidy. Right. He knew a lot about it. Well, so, he, so he doesn't... He doesn't do subsidies. That's his. That's, so that, that right. was that was sort of his his, his slant on it. Was he, he sort of found that sweet spot, be it, you know, where he's not down at the subsidies level, but he's able to provide housing for those who are making thirteen to fourteen dollars an hour, and he, you know he's got his pro forma right down, and he, you know he's the size of the unit. That's really yeah. So that's what, I, that's what I'm getting. Yeah. It's bringing it back to the broader conversation mm -hmm. is that, that some of that is a function of size density. And the things that not, you know people right. might disagree on, but I think that has to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. and that's um, what the market has been in Paris. I mean, yeah. That was cheap. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. That's the niche. Is it one day from a two bedroom? What is it? Twelve hundred and fourteen hundred? Something like that. Yeah. 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 And, and some of that gets down to it. And I think, as with a lot of this stuff, some of the, that can become an uncomfortable <coughs> conversation because people talk about how we need to have affordable housing. We need to be able to have our teachers and firefighters work live in town, but then if they see a certain type of development going in that's more dense than they think is appropriate or is not, you know, just the other night we had people talking about this is not consistent with the character of Scarborough. This is not what Scarborough is about, not to even make the project. But the, that's the kind of thing that I think has to be Address. grappled with. Yeah, it does, and I don't know how to put that into language in the comp plan. I mean, obviously, as a town, we have to deal with this, and when we, when we actually invite the comp plan, we have to keep in mind all of this. But this one they provide here is a little more, again, like it's, it's just too smooth. It doesn't indicate it's not.
to say, because I think to date we have about 250. It's They're paying sort of yeah. as the buildings come online. We don't have all the money, but there's an RFP out on the street um, for that said town is saying, folks, we have, we have funding to help with an affordable housing project, and then there's a process to review that. And, um, ultimately, the council has to sort of allow those money to be spent. Maybe that's what for in here, is that the town needs to more publicly take a stand that says the town is going to be involved in creating this kind of thing. And that's exactly, that, that's, that's closer to what I'm looking for. Has there been a specific strategy in there any uh, communities out there that have come up with something that you know, is a workable strategy? Well, I, and I, I guess that's also part of the what I need to be mindful of with the comprehensive plan. You know, we've already sort of talked about how do we, you know, figure out the environmental issues within, within our growth areas, the affordable housing. The comp plan's not going to answer every no. question. It needs to highlight that these are the areas we need to work, work on yeah. next. That's and it sort of set the stage. So I think we, we just need to be sure, you know, again, we can take these as far as we want, but if we're going to sort of figure out the answer in the comp plan, we, we're going to never yeah. get a comp no, plan. We'll I, just be... I understand. I agree yeah. with you. I like what you just said, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if I can repeat it. Not sure I could either. This is what it is we need to really do now in Scarborough. Right. It's, like like a it it's like a priority setting thing. Yeah. Well, that's what the plan is for. Right? Mm -hmm. the, yeah, these are right. the areas we need to address next. You know, we, we, we got this far based on where we were in the last plan. And kind of rebounding off that, we need to address affordable housing. We need we to, to take it further. We haven't gone right. sort of the statement of, right. we have, here are the things, as you just said, Alan, sort of, here are the things we've done. Right. We haven't gone, we still haven't addressed the, here, look right. at the data. We haven't addressed it. We need to go further. Rather than that waiting sort of until we get to, yeah. I mean, we will do it again yeah. in more detail when we get right. to this kind of thing. Well, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. for a commitment yeah. statement yeah. of some sort. Yeah. 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 Works on that. <laughs> right. I do like the fact that it does talk, it does right. reference. Right. 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 Right.
You know, I'm not trying to make it restrictive, yeah. but you're trying to also <laughs> say, hey, look, it's got to be more right. than just lip service. Right. We have, we've got to really do something. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Is to see, my partner over here says, and then you turn it over to the implementation committee. <laughs> 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 the implementation committee is going to want to know how far it can go. And if, if, this, if, if this document says, go for it, then the implementation committee is going to want to know. Like when this committee or the council says, oh, planning board will. Yeah, right. <laughs> and as we all know, it always becomes a balance, right? You, know, you can have all the ideas around this table, but then there's a whole community discussion that occurs, and there's a host of host of uh, thoughts on every issue, and so, well, this trying to find the yeah, compromises. Is this posted on the website? Uh, so it went on. Um, it, it was attached as part of our yeah, agenda, yeah. and so it'll get put up so online. I wanted to have committees sort of. Will they come back to us with our suggestions? For the so what, what what they're going to do is sort of take what we're doing, and so I think the next time we're going to see all this is as a full package. The previous one that they did and yep. this one. Right. So sort of more that are coming. Right. Yep. So actually, I just received late this afternoon an email from Sandrine that had two more chapters. So I'll be sending those around here shortly. So okay. there's. So yeah, I don't think we're going to get. You're not. We're not going to get this chapter back just like this. I think yeah. we'll we'll see it integrated. We'll see it with the pictures. So we'll see it. So we're taking minutes that are going to capture sort of our concerns, and so we'll be able to sort of go back and so either hold hold on to your draft, which yeah, is not a bad idea to do with your notes, but we can also once we do get the full draft, we can go back into our minutes and say okay, we talked you know as a reminder of what we talked about. But I am um, essentially what I what I'm doing with each of these is I'm sending back to Sandrine sort of a list of yeah. comments. Some of them are, you know, just typo stuff, but a lot of it is sort of the, a, you know, um, sort of policy level stuff that we're talking about here. So um, that's why I was trying to bring up some of the thoughts I had to be sure I'm capturing it right after we're sending these thoughts along and, and then adding what you folks have to say as well. So. Okay. Well, overall, the idea. I think they're doing a good job. Um, I, I don't have any huge negative things to say about it. So one of the comments Jay made, I mean, I think, and, and Karen maybe as well, is that there, I think there's going to be a certain amount of recitation in there because the, you do have to you have to meet the statutory requirements right. for the comp plan. So you got to you got to check all those boxes, uh, and there are also going to be things that are sort of repeating or reinforcing what was in the old plan, which is appropriate, too. Uh, but I agree that there are areas where it can be flushed out. I think the idea of this is what we did. What the previous plan said, this is what we did, and this is what we did. And that, this is written in such a way that, you know, that you can pull the ideas out that you can put on the timeline. So that, you know, again, we address them full-fledged again. Yeah. Um, and uh, talk about the Anything else? Public comment? Any yes. public comment? Public question? Um, what's the timeline for this in terms of uh, turning around a more or less full draft and making it available to the public and how's that going to happen? Um, so let's see. Hopefully we'll see the full draft in the next, I'm not, I guess I'm, I'm not entirely certain when we'll see the full draft, but in the next month or two. Um, and then We'll have to talk about as a committee sort of how, what the process is once we have that from the from the consultant. I think we have talked about in the past, you know, doing um, sort of a road show with it. I would envision, but again, I think as a committee, we'll, we'll want to talk about how we roll it out, how we be sure, how to ensure that we get enough public comment and feedback, and that the community has. And that's the other thing. This is a hefty document. It's a big document. The community is going to need time to soak with it, think about it, read it, and have um, time to sort of deliberate. So um, I don't think it's going to be a quick, hey, we got the draft. Council, here you go. We're, it's all good. I think there's going to be quite a bit of discussion. But again, um, we'll have to talk about that with the community. Okay. Any other 
committee. So hopefully that helps answer some of your questions. It will go to the Oh, we want it adopted by fall. I mean, late fall, or isn't that our goal? It, it's a lot of goal. That right, we can make that happen. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I guess I, 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 my sense of it is eight more than half. Yeah. But it's a matter of. It's very large. Well, what is our requirement as far as the state's concerned? Uh, you know, uh, there's. I'm not really too concerned with the state requirements. That, okay. that we, they're not going to fine us. We're not under any violation. We're working on it. So it's not as though. I, I guess there's very. Uh, that's that's the least of my concerns. Let okay. me put it that way. All right. State, you know. At this point, the state review, and I think we talked about this before, the state review 10, 12 years ago when we adopted this, they had, we had a state planning office that had a dozen people in it. Everyone looked at it. It got sent to every agency. We got, in this, not just Scarborough, but every town, we tons of comments. At this point, there's one guy who basically says, have you guys checked the box? Yep. Okay, this plan looks good. It's it's a much different state level okay. process. So I'm I'm very much less concerned about the state level than okay. I am what we actually do. What, what we have and what the yep. community. So we're not yeah, we're not operating under any kind of arbitrary. We're under no gun. And and the state knows we're working on this, you know, Phil uh, yep. up at the state knows that we're we're doing this process and so we're we're definitely keeping them in the loop. So yeah, I don't think we're under any type of hammer at all. Okay. Okay. Wow. That was a public comment, right? All right. Very good. Our next meeting is a month from Sunday. That's right. We've established sort of doing comp plan meetings. The, was this the fourth Thursday? Fourth Thursday. Thursday yeah. yeah. And then we're our standing long range planning the is, the, is the first Friday, Friday. Friday, Friday. of the month. Okay. So, so next Friday. Yeah. Um, so we back right. here. Yes. Uh, oh. uh, next Friday. Yep. Back here. Next Friday morning is here. Yep. And all meetings in the evening are here in this building. Okay. Thank you. Except for the planning board. All long range planning. Yeah, that's sure. Okay. Fourth Thursday of the month. Our comp plan related morning. Thursday night meetings are all here. Okay. Yeah. And so we'll we'll talk about what an agenda might look like for next Friday.